Welcome to episode 18 of the Thoughts with Lakshman podcast. Um, in this episode, we're going to be focusing on the reunification of Germany after um, World War II. We're going to be discussing basically differences between West and East Germany after World War II and then how they came together in the reunification of Germany. Um, just generally speaking, though, on my podcast, I focus on a wide range of topics, really focusing, though, generally on German culture, studying German as a society, Germany as a society, and, uh, yeah, and just a bit about me. So I started learning German, you know, as a foreign language in my sophomore year, and, uh, and as I got deeper in, like, my courses and you know, my German knowledge, I started learning more about the culture and I became interested in learning about the culture. So I started reading and just finding out more about it because it interested me. And, um, um, because of that, I thought that I would, I was in a good position to create a podcast because I felt that I had the knowledge. Um, I have the knowledge to do so, especially on Germany. And I think that, yeah, I think I can put my knowledge to good use. I can share it with you and it's not difficult i just read you know a, a lot in my free time i spent a lot of time reading about um you know germany and german as a culture and a society and we're going to look at different systems we've already done that we've focused on german you know the german government educational system in germany and we're going to continue to evaluate many different systems and then compare the differences from germany and the united states um to really tell you know really illustrate just how significant or how you know little the difference is and then why it's important um i also like focusing on the history i'm interested in history and i like focusing on the history and then understanding why we are here in the present and how the history has impacted that and i think that's interesting too um but yeah in the future of the podcast um we're going to focus, maybe we might focus a bit more generally, not so specific on culture in Germany, but many, maybe with cultural trends, you know, across the world, um, you know, topics that it can apply to more nations. And then maybe in the future, we might do another deep dive into a country that's very different than Germany to really highlight the difference. Um, I'm thinking in South America or something. Um, but yeah, uh, let's get into the podcast. So like I said, this is episode 18, and we're going to be focusing on reunification. So really, let's just start, right, with the swift and unexpected downfall, you know, the German Democratic Republic that was really triggered, you know, by the decay of the other communist re regimes in, uh, in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. You know, the liberalizing reforms, you know, of President Gorbachev, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, in the Soviet Union, Union really appalled, you know, the Honecker regime. And, and you know, there was desperation, you know, in the Honecker regime by 1988, you know, forbidding the circulation within East Germany of Soviet publications that are viewed as dangerously subversive. And, you know, the Berlin Wall, you know, was in effect breached in the summer of 1989 when a reformist Hungarian government uh, began allowing East Germans to escape to the West through Hungary's newly opened border with Austria. And by the fall, you know, thousands of East Germans had followed this route and basically defeated the purpose of the Berlin Wall. And you had many who sought asylum, you know, in the West German embassies. Um, in the West German embassies, sorry, in, in Prague and Barca, and uh, they de they demanded, you know, that that they be allowed to immigrate to West Germany, and and by the end of September, you know, Genscher, who was still West Germany's former foreign minister, he arranged for their passage to West Germany, um, but you know, another wave of refugees from East Germany soon took their place, but mass demonstrations, you know, took place in the streets of Leipzig, and other German cities, def um, really defied the authorities and demanded reforms. You know, in an effort to halt the deterioration of its position, you know, the SED Politburo 
depose Hanecker in mid-October and replaced him with another hardline communist, Egon Krenz. And under Krenz, you know, the Politburo sought to eliminate the embarrassment occasioned by the flow of refugees to the West through Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Poland. And and on the evening of November 9th, right, Shabowski, who was a communist functionary, he mistakenly announced at a television uh, conference type um, event that that uh, the government would allow East Germans unlimited passage to West Germany effective immediately. Now, while the government had in fact meant you know to require East Germans to apply for exit during normal working hours, this was widely interpreted as a decision to open the Berlin Wall that evening. So crowds gathered and demanded to pass into West Berlin, and the guards were unprepared, so they just let them go. And in, in a crazy, chaotic night, tens of thousands of East Germans poured through the crossing points in the wall and celebrated their new freedom, you know, rejoicing with the West Berliners. And, you know, the opening of the Berlin Wall proved fatal, you know, for the German Democratic Republic. Um, and because everybody left, you know, they didn't have control. Even larger demonstrations demanded a voice in government for the people. And in mid-November, Krenz was replaced by a reform-minded communist, Hans Modrov, who promised free multi-party elections. Now, when the balloting took place in 1990, you know, the SED, which is today called the Dem Democratic Socialism Party, um, it, it suffered a crushing defeat. And the eastern counterpart of Kohl's CDU, which had pledged a speedy reunification of Germany, you know, emerged as the largest political party in East Germany's first democratically, you know, elected people's chamber. And a new East German government, you know, headed by Luther de Maizière, who was a longtime member of the Eastern Christian Democratic Union, and, and backed by an initially a broad coalition, including, you know, the Eastern counterparts of the Social Democrats and Free Democrats, they began negotiations for a treaty of unification. And a, a surging tide of refugees from East to West Germany really threatened to cripple East Germany um, in, and, and really added um, pressure and urgency to those negotiations. And, you know, in July, that tide was somewhat stemmed, you know, by a monetary union of the two Germans, you know, Ger Germany's that really gave East Germans the hard currency of the Federal Republic. Um, and the first barrier to reunification really fell in July 1990, when you know Kohl prevailed upon Gorbachev to drop his object his uh, objections to a unified Germany within the NATO alliance, and really in return for sizable German financial aid to the Soviet Union, and a unification treaty was ratified by the Bundestag and the People's Chamber in September, and actually went into effect on October 3rd, 1990. The German Democratic Republic joined the Federal Republic as, you know, five additional Landa, and the two parts of divided Berlin became one land. And the five new Landa, Brandenburg, Mecklenburg, West Pomerania, Saxony, and Saxony Anhalt, um, they were they were formed. Um, let's focus a bit more now on the struggles, really, of unification. So in December 1990, that was the first old German free election since the Nazi period conferred, you know, an expanded majority in Kohl's coalition. And after 45 years of division, you know, Germany was once again united. And, you know, the following year, Kohl helped negotiate the treaty on a European Union, which established the EU and paved the way for, you know, the introduction of the euro, um, you know, the EU single currency by the end of the decade. Um, the achievement of national unification was soon shadowed, you know, by a series of difficulties, some due to structural problems in the European economy, others to the cost and consequences of unification itself. Like m most of really the rest of Europe, you know, Germany in the 1990s confronted increased global competition, the increasing costs of its elaborate social welfare system, and stubborn unemployment, especially in its traditional industries, you know, sector. And, uh, 
it, it also, you know, on the other hand, faced the staggering, you know, added expenses of unifying the East and the West. Um, and this is often overlooked, but, um, you know, these expenses were all the more unsettling because, you know, they were unexpected at the time. You know, Cole and his advisors had done little, if anything, to prepare German taxpayers for the costs of unification. And that was in part because they feared, you know, the, polit the potential political consequences of, you know, telling everybody, oh, get ready, you're about to be taxed a ton more soon. Um, but also by, because they themselves were actually kind of surprised, too, about the magnitude of the task. They didn't expect it. It was a combination of both. They, it, they expected there to be some cost. They didn't expect it to be a massive cost. And um, they expected a small cost. And they didn't mention the small cost because it, it would hurt them politically. Um, it's interesting. Would they have mentioned it if they knew that there would have been a massive cost? It would have hurt them even more politically, but it's also then, you know, it's then more more significant to the nation to know about it too. Um, and you know, the core of the problem of the of the the uh, payment problem and the unification expenses was that you know the state of the East um, German economy, you know, which was far worse than anyone had realized or admitted. You know, only a handful of Eastern firms could compete. You know, on the world market. And most were woefully inefficient and also environmentally destructive. And so as a result, you know, the former Eastern economy collapsed. Hundreds of thousands of Easterners faced unemployment, and the East became heavily dependent on federal subsidies. Um, at the same time, you know, the infrastructure, roads, rail lines, telephones, and the like, you know, they required massive capital investment in order to provide the basis for future economic growth. In short, you know, the promise of immediate prosperity and economic equality on which the swift and, you know, relatively painless process of unification, unification um, had rested turned out to be basically impossible to unfulfill, um, to fulfill, um, yeah, yeah, to, to, to fulfill, you know, an unemployment, social dislocation, um, and disappointment really just continued to haunt the new you know, Landa states more than a decade after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, you know, the lingering economic gap between the East and the West was just one of several um, difficulties regarding to unification, not surprisingly, right? Many Easterners resented what they took to be, you know, Western arrogance and insensitivity to, towards, um, you know, because a lot of people in the West were, you know, some people were sympathetic, but there were a lot of arrogant people who really looked down upon, you know, people from the East. And, um, you know, the terms Vesi or Westerner and Ossi or Easterner in German, they came to imply different approaches in the world, not just Western East. And that's a problem that they really represented so much more. And that's a clear reflection of the divide between and the major differences between East and West Germany, you know, West, um, you know, is regard it basically means competitive and aggressive. It implies competitive and aggressive, and aggressive, and uh, you know, it's the product of what German Germans call the West Elbow Society, and you know, the East is passive and indolent. You know, the product of the stifling security of the communist regime, and the PDS became you know the political voice of Eastern discontents. You know, with strong um, localized support in some of the new Landa or states again. Um, you know, moreover, um, you know, the neo-fascist uh, German People's Union, which was led um, by millionaire publisher Gerhard Frey, it really get, get garnered, uh, you know, significant support among Eastern Germany's mass of unemployed workers. And, you know, in addition to the resentment and, and delusion over unification that many Easterners and some Westerners felt, you know, there was also a problem of coming to terms with the legacies left of 40 years of dictatorship. You know, East Germany had developed a large and effective security apparatus, you know, the Stasi, which really employed, you know, a, a wide um, network of, you know, professional and amateur informants. And as the files of this organization became um, you know, public, 
You know, Eastern Germans discovered that many of their most prominent citizens, you know, as well as some of their friends and neighbors and even family members, had been on the Stasi payroll. And, you know, coming to terms with these um, revelations, you know, legally, politically, and personally, you know, added to the tension of the post-unification decade. And, you know, despite the problems um, really regarding unification, you know, as well as a series of scandals in his own party, Cole won a narrow victory in 1994. And in 1996, he actually surpassed uh, the record you know, for the longest serving German chancellor since the famous Bismarck. Um, even though he did, you know, serve so long, his popularity was clearly, you know, dying away. It was ebbing away. And, you know, he became more, um, he became increasing, increasingly intolerant, you know, because he faced a lot of criticism within his own party. And, you know, when Cole suffered a a humiliating defeat when his first choice for the presidency was uh, rejected. Um, you know, it, it it hurt him, and it also demonstrated you know the lack of support he had within his own party. Um, you know, as Germany prepared for you know the 1998 elections, um, you know its economy was faltering, unemployment surpassed 10 percent, and it was double that in much of Eastern Germany, which um, which is striking considering how poor Eastern Germany was and, and how few years after, you know, 1998, it's not like you've given Eastern Germany a long time to recover. So as a result of this, some members of Cole's party, you know, hoped that openly, by the way, that he would just step aside in favor of a new candidate. But instead, you know, the chancellor ran again, but he was defeated, which ended his 16 years as, as chancellor. And he was replaced by Gerhard Schröder, who who was more pra pragmatic, and um, you know he formed he was the leader of the SPD, but formed a coalition with the Green Party. And let's just focus a bit more on you know Gerhard Schröder. So um, Schröder's government, you know, got off to a very rocky start. You know, the victim of the chancellor's own indecisiveness and internal dissent from his party's left wing. Um, you know, the coalition also suffered from internal dissension, you know, with foreign ministers, um, and, and Fisher was, um, he really regarded any compromise as a betrayal, almost, of his party's principles. And in 1999, the government's problems were swiftly overshadowed by a series of revelations about, you know, illegal campaign contributions, which forced Cole and his successor you know, Wolfgang Schabel to resign their leadership posts. And in April 2000, the CDU selected Angela Merkel, who became the first former East German, first woman to lead a political party in Germany. Um, Schroeder's government focused much of his of his efforts, its efforts, well, Schroeder and his, his Schroeder's part, government focused much of its effort on really reforming, you know, the German social welfare system and economy. And, you know, in particular, really, you know, the government wanted to reduce the costs of the generous but bloated welfare system, you know, because as the population was aging, the number of beneficiaries was increasing at a rate, you know, exceeding the number of contributors, which really threatened, you know, the solvency of the system. And, you know, the government attempted to relieve the burden on businesses of the country's high taxes and labor costs you know, which had driven away foreign investment and encouraged German firms to close German plants and move them overseas. You know, and the government also, you know, aimed to eliminate the country's reliance on nuclear power, you know, agreeing to phase out its use by about 2022. Um, but, you know, in 2010, the government extended that deadline into the 2030s. You know, when the 2002 election campaign began, the government's efforts to improve the economy had not succeeded. You know, economic growth remained sluggish, unemployment remained high, and they faced they were faced with a you know really vigorous challenge from the head of Bavaria's government, Edmund Soiber, and uh, Schroeder based much of his campaign on you know opposition to U.S. policy, you know regarding you know Saddam Hussein, which is a view that was widely shared throughout Germany, and as a result of that, really Schroeder was able to win 
narrowly in 2002. And in the second, you know, uh, four years, I don't know if they call it terms in Germany, but yeah, in his second, in his entering his fifth year, I guess for our purposes, we can just call it a term. So in entering his second term, you know, the new government attempted to build a consensus for economic reforms, you know, which would require um, sacrifices from trade unions and other, you know, important parts of the Social Democrats constituency. But at the same time, you know, Schroeder sought to repair the damaged relationship with the United States, um, even though he did oppose, you know, U.S.-led military action against Iraq in 2003. But as Germany's economy continued to worsen, early elections were held in 2005, and, and the CDU and CSU won a narrow victory, and Merkel became chancellor, and she became the first woman to hold that office. And yet, now let's focus, you know, the rest on the Merkel administration, and that should take us to about that's what I've prepared so far. So yeah, um, at the start of the new millennium, you know, Germany remained a leader in Europe and was, you know, really key to the continent's security, stability, and prosperity. And you know, for more than fifty years, um, Germans had played an important role in the creation of European institutions. And, you know, Germany remains essential, you know, to the success of both the EU's ambitious program of economic and political integration and its efforts to expand to include members from the uh, former Soviet bloc. Germany um, will also, you know, be an important part of European efforts to craft a new security strategy, you know, based on an enlarged NATO and a revised relationship with the United States. You know, in Germany's parliamentary elections, you know, Merkel's mandate as chancellor was renewed, you know, this time with the CDU, CSU, and uh, winning enough seats to form a coalition. And, you know, Germany, there was a debt crisis in Germany, um, and Germany comfortably weathered the debt crisis that, you know, shook the rest of the Eurozone. And uh, Merkel and, uh, you know, French president at the time, they brokered a series of deals that really were intended to contain the damage of the single currency. Now, while, you know, Merkel's international presence was on the rise, today it's at a pretty high level, but at the time we're talking about 2010, 2011, and it was still rising. You know, she, she did suffer. While it was rising internationally, she was suffering domestically. Um, you know, the resignations of her, of her uh, defense minister and uh, many important parts of her administration were all blows to, you know, her prestige. And after Japan's nuclear accident in March 2011, you know, Merkel pledged to phase out nuclear power in Germany by 2022. Um, you know, um, the Green Party, which, you know, had opposed nuclear power for, for long enough, um, were, were able to win because Merkel announced her new support to phase out nuclear power too late. So elections didn't go so great. So she lost, her party lost, you know, um, seats in, in, in elections. But overall, though, you know, uh, uh, she did well. And, you know, as the campaign, you know, for the 2013 federal elections began to intensify, you know, the CDU coalition continued to suffer setbacks at the state level. You know, elections in Lower Saxony in January 2013 shifted the balance of power in the Bundesrat and really gave the Greens and the SPD a majority, you know, in the upper house of Germany's legislature. Um, you know, Piers Thrinbuk, who was an SPD candidate for chancellor, had served as a finance minister under Merkel in the Grand Coalition government from 2005 to 2009. And his performance in that role was widely praised. And its connection with the Merkel administration you know, made it difficult for Steinbrück to really set himself apart from the incumbent. And part of the reason he was able, you know, it was, it was a weird election because you had two people who respected each other, worked with each other, and knew each other well, running against each other. And, you know, Merkel was the incumbent, but he didn't really criticize her the way another candidate might have. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the televised debate between the candidates was, you know, inconclusive. 
And, you know, Merkel's personal popularity was bolstered by strong economic numbers, you know, which included an unemployment rate that was the lowest since reunification. Additionally, you know, her handling of the economy and uh, her overall, um, you know, just approach to the Eurozone debt crisis, you know, appeared to receive a huge endorsement from the German electorate. And, you know, she did very well in 2013. Um, and yeah, she, she won easily. Um, you know, Merkel's third term was really dominated by internal and external threats to the stability of the EU. You know, the, Steer the uh, Syrian civil war, you know, ongoing strife in Libya, unrest elsewhere in Africa and the Middle East precipitated, you know, an influx, really, of refugees in Europe on a scale unseen since World War II. And as countries reinstated internal border controls, it appeared that one of the hallmark, you know, achievements of the Schengen Agreement was under threat. And Merkel remained, you know, committed to preserving the spirit of Schengen. However, though, you know, more than one million migrants entered Germany in 2015. And in Southern Europe, you know, Greece chaffed at, you know, the, the terms of its bailout packages. And in the East, you know, Russia, you know, backed insurgents continue to wage a destructive war in southeastern Ukraine. M Merkel helped broker, you know, a ceasefire agreement between, you know, the warring parties in Ukraine, but the bloodshed still continued. Um, you know, the backlash against migrants fueled the rise of populist and nationalist parties across Europe. And in Germany, the far right, you know, alternative for Germany party, shifted its platform from one that was primarily Eurosceptic to one that was, you know, expressly anti-immigrant and anti-Islamic. The move paid off, and actually the AFD um, posted a string of impressive results, you know, in local elections in 2016. And, you know, the victories of the Leave camp in June 2016, you've got Brexit, um, you know, the election of Donald Trump in the U.S., seem to indicate that, you know, national sentiment was on the ascent again in Western democracies. However, you know, Merkel continued to partition, you know, to position herself really as a pragmatic centrist, you know, having largely ceded, you know, the far right to the AFD. And in November, you know, she, she announced that she was going to run. November 2016, she announced she was going to run as a run for her fourth term. And um, you know, when elections were held, um, she, Merkel um, did win, um, but it was a lot closer. And the AFD narrowly missed out on the 5%. They nearly got um, enough votes to have seats in, you know, in, in the Bundestag. But yeah, Merkel still... Merkel did well, and today she remains in power, and she's doing well. But yeah, that really brings us to the end of the podcast. Based on a recap, we just discussed the history of German leadership after, you know, World War II, the differences between the East and West, major leaders that played a role, and then after they reunified, the problems that they faced in terms of the expenses, and then the more recent history, how everything's working together. Because remember, Merkel's actually from East Germany. Which is very, and she's a woman too, which is interesting because she was the first woman ever, you know, to be a chancellor. And the fact that she she's from East Germany makes it even more impressive and more like remarkable that she's accomplished so much. But yeah, thank you for listening to the podcast. I hope you listen to many more in the future, and uh, goodbye.